10. Okay, I see that. Well, I think I'm gonna start. We're gonna call the meeting to order. This is the Vermont State College Board meeting. Uh, it's June 16th at 1 p.m. and we are going to have a full agenda. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, for a housekeeping note, we do have a link to sign up to provide public comment. It's available on the agenda, published on the VSC website, or is the link posted in the chat? So I welcome anyone who wants to do that to make use of that, that link. Um, I'm gonna start off by introducing and uh, welcoming the new trustees. We have Shirley Jefferson, who is the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Diversity at Vermont Law School. Shirley, wave your hand. <laughs> there she is. Shirley has testified in the past to us and is, um, is a lawyer who is a graduate of Vermont Law School and has been working there for quite a, quite a while. And uh, we welcome her. Thank you for, for joining us. We really appreciate your, your dedication and your, your service. Uh, the other new person is Sue Zeller, who is the, there she is. She is recently retired from state government. She worked for finance and management and worked for the office of the administration and is the uh, performance manager. And she can explain that to us all if we have any questions as to what that involves. But um, she is recently retired. She was the, um, she, her, her specialty is um, key indicators uh, performance measurement. And uh, again, we welcome you. Thank you very much for joining us, Sue. Uh, we're going to put these people to work right away. And then also reappointed, although he's certainly not new, is Sean Tester, who is the administrator, the CEO of the North Northeastern Medical Center. Is that correct? That's it. It's in St. Johnsbury. So Sean, thank you for continuing your service. Thank you. I also want to thank Linda Milne, who is no longer uh, going to serve. She got replaced uh, after a long time of service here. She, um, she was the chair of the Audit and Risk Management Committee for many years. Her background is, is a CPA, and she was an invaluable member of, uh, of the board in, in dealing with the audits and uh, the financial analysis that they required. So she will not be here today. We will see her and uh, talk to some other people in August and give a formal resolution thanking her and others. So thank you, Linda. Well, we're now gonna move on to the approval of the minutes. I have um, the minutes for May 10th at the board meeting and uh, I need a, a motion to uh, approve the minutes. So moved by Ma Mary Moran, any second? By Ryan Cooney, thank you. And, um, any discussion or questions? Okay, seeing none, all those uh, in favor of approving the minutes of May 10th, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Um, okay, thank you. Any, any opposed? We also have the minutes of May 18th, which was a special board of trustees meeting and I'd like to see someone make a motion to accept those minutes. Is that you, Sean? Ryan. A second by Sean. Good. Okay. Any discussion of those minutes? Okay. Seeing none, all those who are in favor of passing the minutes of May, approving the minutes of May 18th, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, we now have our report from EPSL. The EPSL committee had an important report that they listened to and that they are reporting back to us. I will turn this over to um, Megan Clover, who is the chair of that, and Yasmin, she can also join in. And we have some guests here. Megan, do you want to introduce the members of the RPK group? Excellent. Thanks, Lynn. And just for context, we're actually going to take up four motions today. Two of them relate to the um, report that you're about to hear from RPK group, which is on um, the program array across the three institutions, Castleton, um, NVU, and Vermont Tech. And just for a little bit of context, particularly because we have some new board members that we're welcoming today, this is work, this is the final report out of work that's been going on for about six months. Um, the EPSL committee just about four weeks ago 
benefited from a deep dive into this work. Um, Rick and his colleagues spent about an hour with us giving a much longer presentation um, to accompany the, the 60 page report um, that you that we had shared last week. Um, and we may need to get that to our new board members. So I'll, I'll make sure you have that after this, after this conversation. It's an, an interesting moment of transition. Um, but we did benefit from that hour long discussion and a deep vetting and deep dive into the work that's been done as we put forth the um, motions today. Bill, I think you had a question. Well, I, I'm in the interest of folks who are listening and possibly our new board members, EPSL doesn't really mean a lot if you don't know what it stands for <laughs> or what its charge is. So I thought maybe we should not try to use that acronym. At least, at least we should say what the acronym stands for before we go too much further. Excellent and fair point and a nice test for me. Education policy. Uh, student life. Student personnel. Life. Education, now. personnel, and student life. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I just didn't. <laughs> if I fail, am I replaced as chair? Is this how this works? Oh, okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Bill. Yeah, so this, this is the committee. Um, and for the, again, as we as we expand our 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 group here, um, so this is the committee where we take up um, pieces related to the educational programs. In the past, um, as um, our institutions have put forth new programs or looked to transition out of existing programs, they have come before the EPSL committee. Um, and this report out that you're about to hear from Rick really represents a transition in how we think about programs and shifting us from really a one-off look at programs as they come up to a more holistic, ongoing framework for how we think about the programs across the system and how we come up with a common set of metrics to um, measure those going forward. Um, so Rick, I will turn it to you for your presentation and then we'll have some further questions from the board and then we'll take up the two motions. Terrific, and thank you, Mick, and, and thank you all of you for including us on your very full agenda today. I'm Rick Stazlaw, the founder and senior partner with RPK Group, and I'm joined here today with our project lead, Katie Hagen. Just want to thank you for the opportunity that you gave us to partner with you, with the senior leadership of the system, with faculty and staff on this project. You've all received our findings and recommendations in advance, so we're going to focus on the highlights and then make sure we have plenty of time for discussion, as we go through our findings and recommendations, I would just echo the comment Megan made a minute ago that we believe that what we are sharing with you, what we've built together is more than just some data and analysis, but it's really a new way for the system to look at itself, a new framework that we think will provide benefit going forward. So let me turn this over then to Katie Hagen, who's a senior analyst on our team, to walk you through what we discovered. Katie? Thank you, Rick, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. As Rick mentioned, I'm just gonna walk through uh, the framework at a fairly high level, talk a little bit about the output, and then we'll end with our recommendations that I think will pair nicely with um, what Megan's gonna talk about in terms of the motions. Um, but we will take questions at the end, and uh, as was referenced, there's a long report and lots of recordings of us going through this, this information with different stakeholders over the last several months. So if you need more detailed information, we're always happy to provide it. Um, so we wanna really focus here on the framework component that emerged as a result of this process. So as Megan mentioned, what's, what's most typical within systems at institutions is that uh, programs are evaluated on a singular sort of one-off basis um, when they're up for review or when you're thinking about launching something new. Um, what's not as common is sort of a portfolio approach to evaluate all of the programs within, a, within an institution or within a system. Um, and so that's what we developed here. We call it the program evaluation framework. It's inclusive of all programs at Castleton, Northern Vermont and Vermont Tech over a five-year period. And the ideal portfolio will be able to, to meet the following criteria. Um, one, uh, aligning to student demand, what it, it provides students, what they're asking for. It aligns with your labor market demand in the state and serves state employers. It delivers on student success, so students are able to, to enroll in the programs and complete successfully. Uh, and it also is, is financially sustainable for the institution and ideally accessible to all Vermont students in some capacity. And so we evaluate programs using this framework uh, on the above criteria, the criteria I just listed, 
but it doesn't prioritize any one metric above another. So it, it's really critical for a portfolio to be balanced. I think this is most often thought about from a financial sustainability perspective, right? That not every program has to generate a lot of revenue. In fact, lots of things that are so important, uh, nursing is a really good example here, don't often make any money at all. They lose money uh, and that's okay. That's totally understandable, but you also have to do things as an institution that help offset some of those things that are more expensive and mission critical. Um, so it's, it's important to note that you know, as we look at the outputs here, that not not thinking that every every single uh, metric is is as important as another, just sort of depending on the program that you're looking at. So once you have the framework in place, how does it support your work uh, as board of trustees? So one, it helps you identify the strengths in your offering. So what are sort of the things that that you all are best at should be should be highlighted and and um, and known for. It helps you realize efficiencies to identify opportunities for reinvestment. It'll help make sure that you're meeting both the student and labor market demand. It really helps drive decision making from a data informed um, from a data, data informed place, and supports a cycle of continuous improvement. So when we think about the the existing portfolio across these three institutions, sort of what, how did we define the universe? Um, when we looked at these three institutions, there were more than 200 active programs across the three institutions covering six different physical campuses. And when you're looking at three different institutions like that, you have to sort of find units of analysis. Um, and so we rolled up all of the individual programs to what's called a, a SIP code, which is the classification of instructional programs. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a schema that's sort of uh, attached to programs by the U.S. Department of Education. And then the SIP codes are grouped according to discipline as well. So um, based on that SIP code, we were able to say, you know, something like I'll use psychology as an example that's offered at both NVU and Castleton, but has the same SIP code. So we didn't treat it as two distinct psychology programs. Instead, if we're imagining this as a new, newly formed combined institution, you have one psychology program. So let's combine the data from those two places. So that's, uh, so the, it's a good way to eliminate duplication of effort. So once we do that, we end up with 126 uh, rolled up programs that are enrolling about 5,000 students annually. And then we took all of those rolled up programs and then created what we call areas of focus. Um, you can kind of think about these like departments, though they're not perfect parallels for departments. Again, it was a way to organize information, uh, creating a different unit of analysis. Um, you will likely sort of, as you move forward into this new institution, replace this concept with actual departments and, and structure the institution uh, you know, more traditionally with departments and programs that are affiliated with those departments. But this is the language that you'll see throughout. So when we look at the overall findings of this framework, we see really strong concentrations within areas of focus. You have some really core areas that serve a lot of students across the portfolio. We also see some clear areas of investment and optimization when looking at size and growth. So some areas that are growing, um, that are, that are you know, again, significant concentrations um, and should be considered in terms of the, the level of contribution that they are making to this, to this overall portfolio. We also see that within your areas of focus, you largely do serve Vermont students. Um, so not new information, I'm sure, but um, there are some areas that, that serve primarily out-of-state students. So that's also good to know sort of the difference um, by program or by area of focus so that you're aware of, of the implications of that particular program in terms of who they're serving. And then we also see lots of opportunities to enhance teaching efficiencies through streamlining the portfolio and reducing duplication of effort. So as I mentioned, again, I'm not picking on psychology, but it's one that folks can sort of understand quickly. Um, if you're offering psychology at two different institutions, uh, if you are able to find some opportunities for uh, consolidation within those two programs and sharing of labor and sharing of courses and things like that, there's some clear opportunities for efficiency as you reduce that duplication. So when you look in the report, you'll see a, a sample framework output for every area of focus. So communication and journalism is a good area of focus to look at here, because uh, they didn't have, there's not a lot of programs within this, and they uh, represent uh, some diversity in terms of recommendations. So here across the top of this chart are all of the different data points we looked at um, by each program. Um, size and growth, this sort of scoring, as well as market scan. These are uh, sort of hybrid metrics that we explain more thoroughly in the report. Um, and then the average annual enrollment, matriculation rate, institution retention rate, 
four-year graduation or transfer, six-year graduation, and the total number of degrees produced within five years. So you looked at all of these variables across all of the different SIP codes or programs that you had within this newly defined institution, this combined, combined of the three institutions. And uh, we made three different recommendations across these different programs. We uh, recommended either investing in the program as an area of growth for the institution, um, optimizing the, the existing programs, and I'll talk more about what that means in a minute, uh, or eliminating the program based on the metrics that, that we saw um, as a result. So I wanna talk quickly about optimization. So this is really the most critical piece of the work that as you work towards sort of putting three different uh, institutions together and creating uh, the this, this singular institution for the state of Vermont that's gonna serve students the best, um, you are gonna run into air, you know, instances of duplication of effort or instances where uh, a program can change slightly to better realize the goals of the institution, particularly in, in terms of serving more students across the state and, and achieving that rural educational mission. So when we look here at uh, digital communication and media communication as two separate distinct programs, the reality as, as things are right now is that one of those programs is, the, is referring to the program at NVU. And the other one is referring to the program at Castleton. Uh, they're, they, they have a lot of commonality, um, but they are not perfectly the same. Um, and so from an optimization perspective, there is work that can be done by the faculty within these two programs to try to identify potentially one program offering that, that combines the best of both of these two programs that will then be available to more students uh, statewide, particularly if they think about different modality options to be able to reach more students. So from an optimization perspective within this area of focus, that's something that faculty can go and, and work to achieve um, over the course of the next several months. And then when we think about elimination, uh, we didn't actually recommend eliminating that many programs um, as a result of this analysis, but when the ones that we did recommend for elimination just weren't producing that many degrees, had fairly low enrollments, were, um, were shrinking. So what the size growth metric here indicates that this program is below median size um, based on other bachelor's degrees within this analysis and is uh, declining in enrollment or below median enrollment growth um, and has only produced uh, two degrees uh, in, in the five years of the analysis. So that's the general idea of the framework. So uh, based on, on our analysis and based on working with the uh, the three institutions and, and uh, system leadership over the last several months, we have three key recommendations. So the first one is to adopt a program evaluation framework. So the framework that we just walked through as a starting point that can evolve over time and use this framework to report on health of the, of the health of the portfolio to you all as the trustees annually. Um, this could include an update to your existing policy 109 um, or a different um, sort of mode by which you would, would adapt this framework. But I think in moving forward, this is a, a very replicable process that could be done and reported to you on an annual basis. The second recommendation is to optimize the academic portfolio. So we uh, recommend that you should carry out the work of, of, of optimizing the portfolio, beginning with the work that is um, it's already sort of starting um, with this summer. Uh, so this would allow you all to recruit a new class of students into the unified portfolio as soon as potentially fall of 2022. And one metric that we do recommend setting here is achieving a 25% improvement in the number of student credit hours per faculty FTE. So as I talked about duplication of effort, this, this metric is really intended to try to reduce that duplication that might exist um, in terms of having three separate institutions oper operating some, some somewhat similar programs uh, in some areas. And then our third and final recommendation um, is to review and make final decisions on the recommendations for program investment and elimination that will be informed by the summer optimization work that the faculty will soon begin. That's all that I have. I'm happy to take any questions that you all have. Any questions? Dylan, do you have something? Yeah, um, Megan had Jen send out the, or Yasmin send out the 60 page report, which was very um, detailed. If there's any questions, student credit hours are 
Maybe I'm going to ask a question. Katie, can you talk about this, the number of student credit hours per FTE and where we stand with what your examination is for the Vermont State Colleges? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the number of student credit hours uh, that we're referring to here is the number of student credit hours that are delivered. So being taught um, that students sort of take and translate it into that student um, to that student side. So a course is three credits. If 10 students are enrolled in a course, that course produces 30 student credit hours. Um, and then faculty FTE is actually defined by the load. So, uh, so a faculty in, in this um, analysis, um, typically having a 4-4 load or teaching eight courses over the course of a year. So you sort of take all of the, all of the um, activity of the faculty and you sort of somewhat divide by eight to get into that faculty FTE or full-time equivalency. And then you think about of all the student credit hours that were delivered and all of the labor that you had from a, a full-time equivalent, equivalency perspective and this, you, know, you just divide those two, um, that gets you to your, faculty, your, your measure of productivity or teaching productivity, which is student credit hours per faculty FTE. So the average for the three combined institutions, which uh, again, you know, if we're, we're sort of smushing together three different institutions and it's not a perfectly sort of scientific thing in the sense of you wouldn't expect to achieve perfect uh, productivity given that that's three completely different institutions right now, um, but the average is 300 student credit hours per faculty FTE. Uh, and there's a wide range across that, right? And it's, it's, it's a very standard range that we'd see at most places um, in terms of discipline. So you have sort of the, the nursing and health sciences having somewhat of a lower productivity uh, metric. There are student credit hours per FTE metric, and you have business at the other end having a higher metric. And those are very normal poles to have within an institution. Um, but what we can, can confidently say across all of the, across all the areas of focus is that when you are able to achieve this optimization, when you are able to effectively combine these three institutions and eliminate any areas of duplication, you will be able to achieve growth on that metric. So overall, you know, setting something like potentially growing to 400 as an average for this new institution over the next year or so, that is a very achievable goal for you because the, just this natural process will occur of, of reducing that duplication. And then just building on Katie's comment, because I think this look at what we guys as faculty throughput is a great example of a framework that also supports you from a data perspective that can impact culture. Why do I say that? Well, when you think about efficiency metrics, typically for faculty, when we think about load, we're looking about the number of courses we're teaching. And that's very important. But as you connect into the business model, it's really not a really good translation. Whereas if you look at the number of credit hours you're teaching, it really does translate better into revenue generated and net revenue. Secondly, there's this element in the framework, which is part of RPK's lens of how do we get more for the resources we already have? Not by saying to everybody, please work harder, but let's use data to make smart decisions so that the work we're doing best taps into what students are asking us for, what the labor market's asking us for. So this way we can shift our most valuable resource, which is really people and time, right? Towards the things we're most passionate about to plug into mission and student success. So it is an important metric. It does help you understand and improve efficiency and you'll wanna track it carefully, but it also reflects a way to think about people, time and money differently as you move towards an overall sustainable model. Bill, do you have something? Well, I, I was, I mean, in one of the notes in the report, it was talking about that there was some suggestion that uh, there are perhaps other metrics that should be merged with uh, the credit hours as well, such as research, uh, et cetera. I, I'm reminded of, uh, I, many years ago now, but I uh, was the uh, director of a mental health agency and you could, we you know, try to measure the number of uh, client hours that, that, that uh, psychotherapists or counselors were, uh, patients they were treating, seeing, et cetera. And, and of course you had to also take into account that there had to be some people providing supervision uh, so that if you didn't uh, give someone credit for the time that they were doing supervision, uh, your your whole program really didn't function. Uh, so it's it's there, there's a it's there are different metrics that need to be uh, 
uh, included to in ensure that you're reflecting the overall requirements of a successful institution. So I just find myself thinking about that in, in the course of this. But yeah. I also find this, I, I also find this, frankly, an exciting framework within which to be able to think broadly across mm -hmm. all of the institutions, the three institutions and our uh, emerging new uh, university institution, mm -hmm. which, which is a framework we haven't had in the same way before. Yeah. Thank you for that, Bill. I mean, a couple of thoughts there. One, I know before we started, uh, you all were talking about healthcare, hospital. You know, it's a great example because they're so far ahead of us and we can learn a lot in terms of what are good metrics? How does it help us make informed decisions? Secondly, to your particular point here, absolutely. As Katie said earlier, you wouldn't want to just look at one metric, right? We've got to look at a host of things. At the same time, we don't want to look at 100 metrics, then we get a little lost. So it's like, what are the key things for the moment we're in and where we want to go? Your good point about research and administration is a good one. It's why we often say this work isn't a math problem, meaning if the metric average is 10 and you're nine, it's not like something automatically happens, right? You take a step back and say, well, what's going on there? Let's take a look at release time or the the combination of research, teaching, and service. And does that look like we've set those dials correctly? And the third piece I think is around the framework and I'm glad it resonated with you. We think unabashedly that what you're moving towards here can really serve as a model nationally for what systems need to be thinking about in terms of how they best leverage themselves and really take advantage of that idea of systemness. And that's no small thing. Sean, did you have something to say? Yeah, just a uh, clarifying question for me, and, and it's probably obvious, but um, uh, first off, I really like the framework. Looking at the data empirically like that is really helpful to me. And I really appreciate the, the systemic approach. Um, when I read this, I said, ooh, the heavy lifting here is really once you get into optimizing those programs that need to be optimized, right? And uh, I, I hope to see an extension or uh, a toolkit developed to give the teams that are working on the faculty and um, s some resources and tools to help guide that decision-making process. Can I also uh, anticipate that as part of that optimization, as you consolidate programs, there will be consideration given for how to effectively deliver those programs across multiple campuses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll apologize for my dog. I'll go on mute. Uh, Sean, if I may, I'll, I'll I'll jump in here and say that you're you're right on and anticipating that 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 is where the the big lift is. I'm I'm thrilled to be able to report to you all that we have 85 faculty committed to participating. We're we're kicking off next week with this work. And um, you know, in terms of that that structure and guidance for people, it's it's around some of the things that Katie has talked about. So getting to singular programs, right, where we might have duplication, that's that'll be a big consideration. Thinking about shared curriculum in a more nuanced way, is there one general education course that can serve multiple programs? Maybe we have different flavors right now. Can we get a little bit more efficiency that way? And and access for students, right? Um, and then the and then the third piece is around the delivery access more generally, especially if we're thinking about singular programs, is delivering them in a way that they are more accessible and we bring more students in um, for those programs. So, so those are those are kind of the at the high level some of the guidance uh, that we're looking at and certainly you know getting into the weeds of how faculty work through particular curriculum will be will be the focus for the coming weeks. Anyone else? Uh, Yasmin, yes, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the grant that we have for this summer? Ah, so, so yes, we um, were very excited to receive support from the Davis Educational Foundation uh, for this work. They are very interested in, um, as, as Rick said, you know, models for how to do this. And we're doing this in a, in a very comprehensive way. So they are supporting essentially the work of the faculty this summer that, that we can support uh, their time and effort on this project. Any other questions? Megan, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just the one thing I would add is 
um, first, a thank you to Rick and Katie, because I do um, very much appreciate the approach that you brought to this, not just your expertise, but also the way that you engaged faculty across our institutions in this challenging Zoom environment that we're in um, very effectively and um, took the data that you had, vetted it with the faculty. So we really got to a point of there was agreement um, on that data. So just appreciation for both your expertise and your process. And Lynn, I think we have to, to say deep appreciation for our faculty who have spent many, many hours focused on um, helping shape this as the right framework, making sure the data was correct, making sure the culture and the context of our institutions were understood as this work went forward, all while balancing um, the challenges of this past year. So I just wanna make sure that we take a step here and, and appreciate the tremendous effort of Yasmin, of our academic officers, of the faculty in getting us to this point. Uh, well noted. Bill. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't wanna shift any focus away from, because away from the work that's ahead, the work that's being done. But I also found myself thinking, uh, I just wanna ask the question, is there anything because this was a focus on NVU, uh, Castleton, and VTC. Uh, is there anything that comes out of this that is appropriate to be thinking about in terms of the relationship of this new emerging uh, curriculum, et cetera, and CCV? And, uh, and I, I think that would be interesting to have someone be commenting on at some point, perhaps not now, but at some point, I think just, uh, and to have CCV uh, reflect on what they see emerging and what their uh, range of programming is that feeds into this new mm. construct. Sure. I mean, I think, Bill, all academic work is iterative. And you know, CCV has pathways right now mapped to all institutions. A part of the benefit of now sort of thinking about a, you know, a program array for this new entity is to then be able to say, okay, how does, how does the bridge from CCV to the new entity work? Obviously a shared general education curriculum now is a, is a very robust foundation on which to, to stand the rest of that work. But I'd say part of this is iterative. And so, you know, the first <laughs> summer, right, is, is on, on the new entity side. Right, and that's why I was not suggesting that this is the time, but just to say it's in my mind as we're moving through this major undertaking, that there's also another piece perhaps at some point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, and it's it maybe- That oh, of, sure. of um, <clears throat> Bill's question and Yasmin's response, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm sure this will happen, but I really want to make sure that the appreciation of the board is given to the faculty and staff who've done all of this very difficult work in a very difficult time. So yes, me, and that's your job, right? Happy to, happy to relay that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I think that under the EPSL agenda, we do have the general education that has been discussed and worked on over the past couple of months as well. So anyone else have any questions or concerns about this? Okay, Megan, uh, do you have some suggestions here for us? I do, I have two motions that came out of EPSL's discussion of this um, and I'll go through the first, which is that we adopt the, the, we the VSC adopt the program evaluation framework proposed by the RPK group to guide review of the academic portfolio at Castleton, NVU and Vermont Tech going forward. Okay, yes. uh, that's a motion. Is there a second on this? Karen, Karen Luno, uh, any discussion or any more questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, uh, you have another one. I do. So the second motion, and this very much um, is with thanks to Yasmin for securing the grant to enable this to happen as we go forward. So the second motion on the table today is to charge the chancellor and the chief academic officer to work with faculty to develop a plan for program optimization and to report back to EPSL in the August meeting 
with an evaluation of that work and decisions on the program investments and elimination recommendations made by the RPK group. Do we have a second on that? Karen or Dylan? Any questions or any discussions or anything about that? Just Am I just, go ahead, Bill. Clarification that this is not a motion to make any particular changes in any particular area at this time. We're talking about the framework and the process. Correct. Yes. This is a motion to ask the faculty to come back to us with those particular recommendations. Yeah. Just, just for clear clarity in terms of anything that's laid out in the report. Yeah. Yes. This is just to do the process that they're going to now take up and I'm 85 faculty. That sounds like a good group. Any further discussion or questions, Ryan? I was just curious real quickly, that 85, I agree, is a good number, but is there, a, Yasmin, do you have any breakdown on like how many from each of our campuses are in that group? Like what's that, what's that group made up of exactly? Yeah, it, it is faculty. I, I don't have the exact numbers, Ryan, off the top of my head, but it's it's a robust contingent from Vermont Tech, from, from NVU, from Castleton. Um, there are some program areas that, as Katie said, you know, represent a lot of students or a lot of programs. So we have more faculty in those areas and some, some programs are very small, right? So that's, that's where we've got some variation in participation. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, all those, since there's no more discussion, all those in favor of the motion? for the use of the Davis Foundation uh, for the process of working on the recommendations of RPK, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none. Now there's also the general education and uh, Megan, you may, or Yasmin may wanna discuss where we're going with that at the moment. Yeah, and Yasmin, if you can go ahead and give a brief overview and then we do have two motions on that as well. Certainly. So um, you've already heard a little bit uh, about it. Um, this has also been a significant amount of work this year uh, by faculty to develop um, a shared, transparent foundation of general education requirements. It's not a full ed general education program, but it's designed to be an associate degree core um, that would be consistent across all of our institutions and with the same set of requirements, same learning outcomes. So faculty developed that last fall working with a facilitator. Um, it went through several rounds of discussion and ultimately approval by all of our academic governance bodies, including CCV and the faculty assemblies at the other three institutions. Um, one aspirational goal of the general education program was to include incorporate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion learning outcomes and in really infuse that comprehensively across the curriculum. Um, there was a robust discussion of that, but I think with any ambitious effort, we recognize it's an aspirational goal. Um, all faculty assemblies except Castleton were ready to approve that. Um, so we do have some work to do next year to kind of fully um, embrace that and and I think the 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 thing that came out of the fac the Castleton uh, faculty assembly recommendations was just recognizing there's a lot of professional development that needs to happen for faculty to do this appropriately to do this well. So that's part of our work uh, that we see ahead for next year. Um, another piece that came out of all of all of this discussion about the new general education program was a recognition that the boards, um, graduation standards have been implemented sort of in the past with our with our existing general education programs and this new framework um, really implicitly embeds a lot of those standards but we haven't done that next step of work of sorting out the the practicalities of how assessment of, of graduation standards would happen in the new general education program so the faculty really we're recommending with with all the other change going on that we suspend our current approach um, and we have to sort through even how to what that means to suspend it temporarily while for the next year we work through how we're going to implement that differently so the the two motions um i think that came out of epsil sort of recognize that work um and also recognize there's there's work ahead and direct some of that any further questions 
Lynn, can I make one point before we, we go into questions? Um, Yasmin, I just wanna pick up the, the point on um, suspending the graduation requirements. Mm -hmm. um, that point that, it, that emerged from faculty really did dovetail well with conversations that um, several board members have brought up around the challenges. When those were operationalized and over time, there, those graduation requirements um, seem to be presenting obstacles to students completing their degree and the inconsistency among institutions um, has come to the front of board discussions as a challenge to be addressed. So I think that the, the motion on graduation standards, um, really it's, it's both the faculty interest here as well as several questions that have come up with this group around um, aligning those better to make sure that we've got clear paths and consistent paths for student success. Oh, an awesome question. Anyone with a comment? Okay, motion. Are you ready to make a motion, Megan? Perfect. Yeah, so the first motion, and Mary, this goes back to your very important point made earlier, um, is a motion um, from the board um, recommended by EPSL to commend the significant work accomplished by faculty on the VSC General Education Working Group and all academic governance groups to achieve the initial implementation of the single system-wide general education core. Okay, do we have a second on that? Mary is seconding. Any other questions or, or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Anything else, Megan? What else? So I do have a second motion. Um, so, and this is a motion again, um, generated by Absol to direct the VSC Chief Academic Officers Group to convene a system-wide general education committee for the upcoming academic year, develop a plan to integrate the VSC Policy 106 graduation standards into the new general education framework and to continue system-wide professional development in diversity, equity, and inclusion to support its implementation into the general education program, including how world languages fit into the program with a follow-up report to be provided to EPSL by May of 2022. Okay, uh, second on that motion, please. Karen, we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, does that answer your questions, Bill, about general education? Yeah. yeah. Good, okay, excellent. Um, Karen, you have something to add? I, I just wanna note how very pleased I am that world languages are being highlighted as an important um, content area to be included in our, and emphasized in our in our educational offering, specifically as it relates to diversity and inclusion. I think it's very important and I think this is a major step forward and I'm hopeful that it's gonna bring us to some good places. Okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you very much, Megan. Anything else from EPSL? No, that was all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next thing on the agenda is the transformation update uh, from, I guess, the Chancellor. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm actually going to introduce our incoming Director of Transformation Projects, Wilson Garland, and our Chief Information Officer, Kelly Campbell. Uh, Wilson joined us on June 1st, so just over two weeks ago. And with his guidance, we're starting to build the project management structure for the transformation and administrative consolidation that lies ahead. And then as we have two new trustees today, I just wanna do a quick recap by way of background. Um, last summer, the state created a select committee to study the future of public higher education in Vermont with a particular focus on the Vermont State College system. Uh, through an RFP process that was conducted by the Joint Fiscal Office, um, an external consultant was hired to work with the select committee and the select committee issued an initial report in December and a follow-up report in February and then a final report in April. Um, at the February 22nd, uh, 2021 board meeting, 
the board approved the select committee's two key recommendations. Uh, the first one was that three of the four Vermont State Colleges, so specifically Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, and Vermont Technical College, be combined under a single leadership structure and a common accreditation. And second, that the Vermont State College system engage in administrative consolidation system-wide. Uh, the select committee anticipated a five-year timeline for these changes to occur, during which the Vermont State College system would reduce its structural deficit by $5 million each year for five years. Uh, the select committee also recommended that the state provide the Vermont State Colleges with a permanent increase to our base appropriation, as well as bridge funding in progressively smaller amounts over the years to address our anticipated deficits. Uh, last week, the governor did sign the budget bill, which provides the Vermont State Colleges with a small increase to our base appropriation, uh, the bridge funding that we need for the upcoming fiscal year, uh, funding for transformation and an array of free tuition and scholarship programs for Vermont residents. Uh, the state is mandating that in exchange for the additional funding we're receiving, uh, that the Vermont State Colleges implement the board's approved transformation plan as developed by the select committee. One of the recommendations in the select committee's final report was that the Vermont State Colleges take a professionalized project management approach to transformation, and that is where Wilson comes in. So Wilson is going to provide a presentation on the project management approach that we'll be taking, um, and Kelly will be providing some follow-up uh, with some preliminary information about the role of our information technology systems in the transformation, and we anticipate doing a deeper dive on the IT end of things at a later board meeting. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Wilson and to Kelly. Thank you. Welcome, Wilson. Thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Chair Dickinson and, and trustees for the opportunity to come talk about uh, our initial approach with, with transformation. And I'm sure it will be the first of many opportunities to sort of share where we're going and, and uh, get some feedback. So I look forward to that. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides here. Okay, can you see my, my slides? Yes. Okay. So as I as uh, Sophie indicated, really what I'm going to talk about today is to to give a little background and context as it relates to our approach to project management. Uh, we also are going to talk a little bit about how we're working to assemble the teams that are involved in the in the transformation, um, and then uh, Kelly Campbell and I will talk a little bit about how uh, we will be working together really to. Uh, determine how best to have the transformation work and the technology work uh, work simultaneously. Okay. okay, so in terms of the approach to transformation and, and change within this transformation effort, one of the things that's really central to the work that we're doing is that change and transformation is really about the people. Um, and people are at the center and not just the, the people that are part of the institutions that are part of the transformation, but also really the student is really the, the core concern as we're going through the transformation effort and, and making sure that students and the community and others are involved in the transformation and also aware of what's going on. So that's really important to us. The second thing is that we're really approaching this as a team effort. Uh, you know, there's really the, the central core belief here that teams accomplish more than just groups of individuals. Uh, we can define a shared purpose, come up with ideas from various different sources, and really make sure that we're representing a diversity of perspectives in the work that we're doing, um, and making sure that really all the, all the different functional stakeholders that are involved in the process have a, a voice in the, in the transformation work. Um, also, just the recognition that change is hard is an important thing for us to keep in mind as we go through this, and, and really making sure that as we go through the, the process that we're explaining, not just the what, which is the transformation effort, but also the why and the how, um, and really keeping those questions kind of at the center of what we're doing is important. Um, and then another principle that's really essential is recognizing that technology is the enabler and not the purpose to the work that we do. 
Um, and yet it's, a, it's probably one of the most important enablers. So as we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, keeping the transformation effort aligned with the technology and how we're supporting the work is gonna be essential as we go through this. Um, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit here in a moment about how we're approaching the project management work of the transformation. Um, and you know, I think there's a tendency when we talk about project management to jump into discussion of tools and processes and so on. Uh, but one of the things here in my third week at uh, Vermont State Colleges that I'm particularly aware of is making sure that whatever project management approach that we take is consistent with the needs and the culture of the organization. And so that's something that we're constantly evaluating is how much structure to add and when uh, into the process. So that's important. Um, throughout the process, no matter what different tools and processes we use, uh, some of the successful practices that we'll be employing just to ensure that the transformation stays on track and make sure that there's enough communication to all the different stakeholders are things like seeking frequent alignment of stakeholders at all levels. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the sort of structure we're adding for that, but also just ensuring that we're constantly communicating is really important. Um, also empowering cross-functional teams to solve problems. I think um, in, in past transformation and, and change efforts I've been involved in, it's really important to have that cross-functional, the cross-functional voices at the table um, and then also making sure that it's not just senior leaders making decisions, it's really involving the people that are at the front lines of the work get, that's getting done. Um, and so involving the people that do the work in the process is, is really essential. Um, and then as with any project management work, it's really important to find the linkages and integration points and dependencies that are uh, involved. And, and so that's not only important just at an overall perspective, but also as we talk about prioritizing and sequencing the work, really those dependencies in many cases help drive the sequencing and, and alignment of the work that's getting done. Um, and then finally, I think it's important to have uh, opportunities to engage grassroots leaders in the transformation, not just in the cross-functional teamwork that we're going to do, but also as we think more longer term about, you know, once we're into this, into and through this transformation, making sure that we're setting the foundation for ongoing transformation and innovation and, and change. I and I think that. it's tempting when we think about the transformation to focus on the consolidation and combining into a new combined entity. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we're thinking more longer term about the foundation that we're setting for innovation and, and change and making sure that we include the, the grassroots leaders in that effort. So in terms of implementing structure and process into the project management of this effort, one of the things that I coming in as sort of a, a new person to the team uh, am critically aware of is that there's a lot of great transformation work that's going on. Um, and there's a lot of teams that have sort of been organized or, or self-organized around the, the transformation work some are more uh, ready to get, engage in the transformation than the others. And, and so trying to ensure that we're keeping that in mind is important. Um, and then really our intent here is to come in with a little bit more structure and process to support the work that's going on, not necessarily to replace it, but then also to add the important cross-functional dimension that I talked about. And so we'll be uh, talking a little bit more about that when we talk about the, the teams. Um, but then it's also important given the overall capacity of the organization to realize that not all work needs to be teamwork. And, and there will be situations as we go through this where we wanna um, really as assign ownership of something to a smaller group or an individual and they can get that work done maybe more quickly and efficiently as long as they're operating within the overall uh, scope that we've uh, agreed upon. Um, and then with that, we are gonna start right away and, and begin implementing some tools uh, into the project management process sort of carefully to make sure that we're not overwhelming people with tools because it can be overwhelming to go from none to a lot at once. So uh, with that, the, the two that we're really gonna start with right out of the gate are a project charter template um, that we will use and then also a project status dashboard. Um, the charter is really important because it, it not only identifies a more 
uh, clear purpose as well as deliverables and objectives that go into the, the process. It helps also helps us to identify the dependencies and interdependencies with other processes and so on uh, that we need to keep in mind. Um, it allows us to sort of designate the team members and also to discuss really transparently what the role of the team members are. And, and with this sort of an effort, it's important for team members to not only represent their function or the institution that they're from, but also to be full participants on the team. And in many cases, communicate back to their function or their uh, institution, the work that the team's doing and, and elicit uh, and solicit help in doing that work as it relates to their function. Uh, so the, the charter really is important from those dimensions and really trying to ensure that all the people on the team are starting with the same charge um, and understanding what the work is and being clear on sort of their role uh, in, the, in the work. Um, and along with that, one of the other components of the, the charter that we'll talk about in a moment is the governance and, and sort of being clear on what people's roles are and, and how they play a role, not just the people on the team, but then the others in the organization. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the second tool is the project status dashboard. And the purpose of that is to provide visibility to the other stakeholders and sponsors of the work um, to how things are going. You know, we can't, we can't overwhelm ourselves with team meetings and, and then stakeholder meetings and, and everything else. And, and uh, the project status dashboard really gives the team a way to communicate uh, to other stakeholders and then up to the sponsors. Here's how we're doing. Here's what things are standing in the way. Um, here are just some decisions that we need to have made so we can continue our work. And it's really that that provides the team leader then a way of going to the other stakeholders and having those conversations. And in many cases, getting some decisions or, or things cleared out of the way that the team needs to, to do their work. So mm -hmm. um, I can talk more about that at a, at a later time, but that, that those really are the two tools that we wanna um, start with right out of the gate. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it's important to organize the work, but then it's also important for everybody to have full transparency about how decisions are gonna get made. And I realize there's a lot of words on this slide, but I, I just wanted to put it up here because um, I think often people that are working on the teams are concerned because they're not sure, are they supposed to be making the decision? Are they making a recommendation? What are the parameters around which they can operate? Um, and so it's important to sort of designate all the levels in the decision-making framework and the governance framework. Mm -hmm. um, and that really starts with the sponsors. The sponsors need to have the ability to communicate to the teams, here's your charge, here's what we're asking you to do, here are the guardrails around the work um, so that you can uh, focus your work on what's most important for the institution. Um, along with that, there's other stakeholders across the organization, whether they're functional leaders or institutional leaders that have some stake in the work that's going on and some ownership over the processes that will get impacted in this uh, change work. Um, and so making sure you designate who of the cross-functional stakeholders need to be at the table for key decisions is gonna be an important part of the process. Um, and then obviously the team itself needs to sort of understand what their role is. Um, and, and really it comes down to being a full participant and making sure you're uh, getting your voice heard and, and participating. But then also, as I mentioned earlier, there's this dual communication role where they're both communicating from their institution or function to the team, as well as communicating back to their institution and function from the team. Um, and then engaging other experts as we go to, to do the work. Um, and then it's also important to have a, a team lead designated, even if that's a person who's just in an interim capacity, but leading that team and, and sort of serving as the person then to take uh, recommendations forward uh, to, the, to the stakeholders and to the, the sponsors. So anyway, that's a little bit more about the, the governance direction. We can talk more about that um, later. In terms of the overall sequence of work and how the work will go on for each of the, the different teams that we'll talk about. Um, the, the overall framework is, is sort of a, what we call a stage gate process where the work is broken into different, different stages and we sort of agree on what the deliverables are for each stage and, and how we sort of determine the, the work that's gonna go on then in the next stage. 
And the reason for using this sort of a process, particularly in the higher education environment, is that it is a, a fairly highly regulated um, industry, and there's the need to have uh, the, the, the stakeholders and sponsors at different levels have greater visibility to the work that's going on. Um, so the way that the stage gate process works is you have work going on in the stage, but then before the work can move on to the next stage, you get the sponsors and the stakeholders together to meet with the team and say, yep, we've accomplished our goals of this stage. We're ready to move on to the next. And that's not to say that there might not be individual activities that you know, are going on in advance of the next stage, but it at least gives the stakeholders and sponsors a chance to make sure that they're all on board to, to get it to the next uh, phase. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, how we're implementing the cross-functional team approach uh, to the work. So if you think of the overall scope of the, the initiative uh, for, of transformation, you know, it's all sort of under the umbrella of the uh, uh, VSC system transformation work that we're doing. Um, but within that, there's really the core processes. And I mentioned earlier, it's important to have this organized around core processes and, and cross-functional core processes in particular. So making sure that all the people and functions that impact the process um, are at the table. And the reason for having it be cross-functional is really, if we're taking a student-centered approach here, students interact with the institutions, not with one function or another, typically. They, they are going through a process that is influenced and, and contributed to by multiple different functional experts as they go. And so making sure that we've got those people at the table as we're working on this transformation effort is important. Um, so the four core processes are student experience, academic programs and school operations, administrative operations, and then workforce development, um, which we're suggesting is really its own cross-functional uh, process team that we'll talk about later. Um, then within these sort of macro cross-functional processes, then we have a lot of different sub-projects and processes that we're trying to navigate and, and design and, and change and implement. Um, and so each of the core teams will have other activity that's going on, but that's sort of in their purview of, of work. Um, and so, for example, within student experience, you have groups like admissions and enrollment, uh, financial aid and registrar, marketing, um, student residence life, and so on. So there's different uh, sub processes and sub projects. And again, not everything is going to be a project. Some of it might be in, contributed by an individual. Uh, but it's just sort of keeping aligned the different uh, streams of activity so that the cross-functional teams that have essential ownership over those cross-functional processes have some visibility into what's going on there. So one of the, the core discussions that we're engaged in now is how do we assemble these teams? How do we ensure that we have the right uh, cross-functional representation, that we have the right institutional representation, how do we think about um, the, the folks that are both functional experts as well as have the sorts of leadership capabilities that are needed to be on uh, teams like this? And so these are all the factors that we're going through to try and determine how are we best going to organize this work and who's going to be on, on which teams. Um, I think one of the things, though, that we're particularly aware of as we go through this process is while it's a lot of work to do transformation, uh, there's also a lot of existing work within the institutions that we need to keep uh, on the table and keep moving forward while we're doing this transformation work. So um, that's, that's one sort of capacity constraint that we're uh, aware of there. Um, we also know that you know, some people may be very interested in being on a team, others may not, but uh, there will be opportunities for people to participate that aren't necessarily team activities. And, and so uh, th there's, there's going to be a chance for everybody to take part in it. And so it's, it's not that they'll, they'll be left out. And, and certainly there's going to be communication back and forth between the teams and the functions and institutions as well. Um, and then it's just also important to remember that transform transformation is not a short process. It will uh, extend out over a period of time. And so people will be joining teams and leaving teams as their functional or, or uh, institutional expertise is needed. 
Uh, so that's sort of how we're thinking about assembling the teams. So, and as we sort of looked at the, the folks that are involved in the efforts and at the institutional roles that people play, there's really four additional roles that we've decided we need to add in here to really facilitate the work of the transformation. So obviously there's the, the project management role, which is the, the role that I'm in. And I know you've had some discussion about that in the past. Um, there's also, as we've talked about, so much of the work is related to processes and optimizing processes, documenting processes, those sorts of things. We feel it's an important to have a business and, and process analyst involved in that work and, and really to get down into the details of, of how, that, how that process could be constructed and not just take the existing processes and match the, mash them together, but looking at best practices, looking at ways that we could optimize by creating a new process out of what we've been doing before um, and doing some of that background work as well as the documentation that goes along with that. So it's it's really an, a, an essential role as we're as we're taking on this on this work, and they can also assist with the implementation of some of the project management tools and and other things as as part of that. Um, kind of continuing around the circle there, another role that needs to be uh, sort of joined to this work is a financial analyst role, um, and this isn't necessarily a new position within the within the system, but having somebody who's really assigned to this work, who can help us to model uh, different approaches to the processes and, and so on, um, as well as to assist with some of the, the annual uh, financial planning and budgeting work, uh, because those things are really inextricably linked. Um, and, and having some ability to sort of, as we go on the fly, be able to analyze budgets versus actuals in terms of how we're thinking about some of those things. Um, and then the fourth role is really a business intelligence lead. Um, so that's a, a data and reporting and uh, database expert. Um, and I'm gonna let Kelly just add a couple of points there because this is really a, a role that's core to both the, the IT work as well as the, the work that we're doing in transformation. Yeah, thanks Wilson. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this this business intelligence also referenced frequently as BI lead. Um, and just for quick context, and I think this might have been shared in previous meetings, but um, when I started with my colleague back in January on an interim basis, we did a listening tour around the system and kind of this data reporting institutional research pillar continued to surface up as kind of a top three priority. And so I really see from the IT perspective, this is a position that can not only support the critical work of transformation, but I think it's really going to help us start to put some operational layers in place that I think are long overdue and really su supporting um, on the front end, how we work with our, our community and our constituents to understand how we're uh, wrapping a data governance strategy in place, how we're starting to define our data, a data dictionary, um, ensuring data is going into official systems of record and has some re have some retention policies around them, helping um, in close alignment with the business and process process analyst, um, helping constituents understand, you know, taking things out of spreadsheets, things in emails, and putting them into official systems of record. And I think if we can support that work through the business process redesign, it's going to set us up long-term for a much more sustainable data architecture and really start to support, I think, some of the critical data needs of our organization. So I think this is a, a really exciting position to see on this slide as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the next question, obviously, is we get people in place into these roles and, and think about the work and how we're gonna organize it, is to think about how are we gonna sequence the work? I think it's it's not realistic for us to sort of take on all of this all at once. Um, and you know, as, as both Kelly and I talked about, I think getting some of these roles in place to begin the discovery work is important, even if some of the work will happen um, as we go. So, um, in, in any case, I think as we think about sequencing the work, it's really taking into account the load that's on the key players that will have to play a role in this transformation. One of the principles that we've put forward is really in the first year of transformation, we should focus most of the effort on the new combined entity and how we align the work of the new combined entity, align the processes, align the people, all of those things. 
Um, at the same time, we want to make sure that as we do that work, we've got representatives at the table from CCV that can also uh, both provide some input into how they operate some of these same processes, but then also ensure that as we go through the transformation work and they're looking to consolidate different aspects of the, the background systems and work that we're doing, that we have their voices at the table. And so um, we're trying to be cognizant of that as we go through assigning the teams. Um, and it's not a one size fits all sort of thing. Sometimes CCV has more of a role to play in, in helping us to sort out some of these things, uh, sometimes less. And so uh, we're keeping that in mind as we go, but it's really with the idea that let's focus on the NCE this first year and then begin to um, do some of the other work to uh, get everything else aligned across the system. Um, and then the second principle here related to sequencing is that we're trying to prioritize, prioritize tasks based on student and institution needs with the potential impact on enrollment or cost. Uh, so it's not just about cost and it's not just about enrollment, but it's, it's about how do we keep in, in mind that this is really about the student and their experience um, at the institutions um, and how do we align around those needs. And then finally, uh, I think really as we're sequencing the work, it's important to recognize that there's a lot of different dimensions to this. And, and I, we talked about this a little bit relative to the additional roles, but it's really in addition to the people, it's about the process, it's about the data, and it's about systems there to support the processes and, and the data. Um, and so keeping in mind those three dimensions as we go through this work, are really important to the success of, of what uh, sorts of outcomes we have. So initially, as we go through this work, we're gonna be trying to answer some core questions related to process, core questions related to the data, and then core questions as it relates to the uh, systems. So some of the key questions as it relates to process are, you know, how do we manage the accountability um, when functional and cross-functional processes intersect. And so, you know, who ultimately is accountable for the cross-functional processes, who's accountable for the functional processes. And as we get into how the work is done and how it needs to be aligned, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Um, a second core thing, which I think is at the center of what a lot of people think about with transformation is which processes should be common and which processes should be unique. So are there some that need to be different for different institutions? Are there some that are similar enough that we really should find one way of doing them? Um, and we're really going to try and tease that out. And, and kind of the, the principles behind how we answer those questions are really going to be about, does the unique process that an institution or department has, um, is that driven by a, a specific student or institution need um, that drives better value to the student or to the, to the state? And so Keeping that value at the center of how we make that decision, I think, is, is going to be critical. Um, and then also trying to find those common process areas where we really can drive better quality and better efficiency by having a shared service approach to how we're doing it. So as we dig into each of the, the core process areas that I talked about earlier, we'll really be trying to answer those questions. Um, and then overall, how do we use process to create better efficiency and effectiveness in general um, and and really reducing you know the systems and software customizations and other things that that Kelly will talk about here in a minute. So now I'll turn it over to you Kelly to go through uh, data and systems here. Thanks Wilson. So um, also some key data questions that need to be answered through this process. So it's kind of threads to the BI position I referenced a minute ago, but how do we construct a shared data and reporting architecture that ensures transparent transparency and accountability? And um, I also think trust, I would add to this too. So, you know, I think right now um, in some spaces we're challenged to trust some of the data coming out of our systems. Um, data is living in a lot of places. And so that's, this is a question that we need to, to answer through this process because data will need to support not only, like I said, the work of transformation, um, but also just our day-to-day -day work. Um, and how do we prioritize a data first strategy that starts with the questions and works backwards? Um, and I think, 
you know, from my perspective, sometimes we bring data and spreadsheets to meetings or, or to different discussions and we say, what is this telling us? And I think the, strate the strategic nature of how we might want to approach this is more, you know, what are the major questions that we need to answer? Um, what are the KPIs? And really start to define those from a strategic perspective and work backwards, ensure that we are organizing, collecting, and putting data into the right systems to be able to address those big, big questions ahead of us. Um, and then how do we ensure common data standards, definitions, and single versions of truth so there truly is trust in the data that is being provided to do the work ahead of us? And again, that threads critically to the BI position I referenced a minute ago. Um, Wilson, if you don't mind, uh, the next slide and some system questions. Um, and as I start to think about kind of the role of IT in supporting transformation, um, I think, you know, IT plugs into every aspect of our um, of our system. We work with every academic and, and uh, business department. And so we have a lot of systems to support that work. So some really critical system questions that need to be answered. Um, and so how do, how do we ensure our systems align with the determined business process redesign? And that's why I'm really excited about the, the structure that Wilson and team have um, put in front of you all today, because I think we really need to focus on that business process redesign and then wrap the technology around it. That's a really critical, um, I think, approach from my perspective. And we have to ensure that our systems are agile and flexible enough to adapt to the needs of our system over time. Uh, we have to uh, establish some future governance um, and some sustainability around these systems um, and continue to ensure that we uh, realize the best value out of these systems. And then um, the process and vision work that Wilson outlined today, you know, and the work ahead of us informing our next generation of systems. So whether that be our ERP, our CRM, which is, you know, we use that for admissions um, front end, how we are um, delivering the scheduling solution, how we're using kind of our advising software, our learning management software. There's a lot of technology and systems to support our quote business. And we need to be sure that again, as I said, it's aligning with the vision work, the vision work ahead of us. Um, and that I think really Wilson said it speaks to technology as the enabler, um, not the purpose. So um, and then the last slide here, and then I think we'll wrap up with some next steps, but I just, I think this gives, this is a slide that I think really gives um, a critical example to maybe what we're talking about here. And Wilson spoke a moment ago about some of the structure of where can we be common versus unique. Um, and I think Colleague is uh, currently um, our, the hub of our enterprise application portfolio. And I think this just speaks to maybe some of the current unsustainability wrapped around some of our systems and how, um, uh, how we need to kind of address this through the process. And so, you know, there's concerns around kind of not only our current IT FTE supporting some of our critical systems, but really heavy reliance on our expert users across the system. And we have some really, really wonderful and capable individuals across the system working very closely with us in IT, but they also, you know, are hired to do very different jobs and not necessarily, uh, you know, support the enterprise uh, from the technical perspective. So we need to find sustainability in terms of how we're resourcing and supporting these systems. Um, the customization, the third column there, you know, we've had colleague in our environment for 20 years, but I think the customization there speaks to um, and this has been by design in some nature, but just the customized, the customizations we've wrapped into our environment to serve the individual needs of all of our institutions, which was what is needed at that time. And through this business process redesign, how do we start to shed some of that? Because it really is expensive and difficult um, and unsustainable to support an architecture that, that customized and that dynamic um, and to ensure we're wrapping some governance around it. And then all of that feeds really to the reporting complexity I think we also have um, and, and that we continue to hear from our community, a very valid concern. Uh, we need to be able to do efficient reporting to support, as I said, our transformation work, but our day-to-day -day operations. And, and right now this is really just an unsustainable architecture. So I'm really um, putting this in front of you all today to just show the example of, of how, um, how critical it is that we put this structure in place as Wilson outlined. And I think um, in following a structure such as this and allowing the IT to kind of wrap under it, I think is gonna much better position, position us not only for the transformation work ahead, but, but years beyond transformation as well. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, you know, obviously Kelly and I are gonna be working very closely together as we go through this process. Um, 
really as we're thinking about sort of the next steps, you know, obviously we're in the process of thinking about the teams and, and organizing those teams and, and getting those kicked off. Uh, we also are, you know, probably the first team out of the gate is going to be the, the brand identity work. And then that's really core to um, the transformation as well. Um, and then we'll be, as we assemble the teams and working as teams, going to be doing the process discovery and planning around each of the core processes and sub processes as we go, really ensuring that we're taking a student student centered approach and trying to come up with a common process where possible. Um, and then obviously there's the project planning and prioritization because we won't we can't do all the projects at once, but each each core team will be involved in sort of determining how we're going to sequence the work and, and keep the work going while also making sure we've got enough capacity to do the, the other work of the institutions. So those are kind of our, our four key next steps of, of things that we'll be working on before the next time we get together. Mm -hmm. I think that was our. That was it. Yeah. That was it. Just a few slides. <laughs> so now I, I think we're uh, available to take any questions that you might have. Any questions? There you are, Sue. Um, not a question, but I have to say this is uh, delightful. Everybody, both the programmatic approach to um, the educational selection and this uh, uh, project management approach to the optimization of the systems is, you know, singing my song. So I'm very excited. This has been wonderful to hear from my perspective. Thank you. Jim, Thank did you. you have a question? Me? Yes, you. Okay, sorry, my, the volume's terrible on this machine. Um, I had a question several slides back, the one about um, data driving the questions, if that makes sense. I didn't write the things down as they went flying by, but I had, I had two questions on that page, if someone could fly back to that. It was about, about three slides back or four slides back, not, not way, way, way back. I think that's slide 14, Wilson, if I'm... This one? Oh, I, I, I don't think you're sharing anymore, Wilson. You may have to. Hmm. Yeah, I'm that sharing. one, thank you. <laughs> um, this uh, first bullet, how do we construct a shared data reporting architecture? Oh, the next one. How do we prioritize data first strategy that starts with the questions and works backwards? That's, that's an intriguing bullet. It's kind of counterintuitive, counterintuitive, um, and I really look forward to seeing how that works. Because in the sort of normal course of events, we'd form some questions and then we'd go find some data and see what supports what. Um, and I just find that um, an intriguing approach, but I think it's really correct. And um, so this is not so much a question as a as a comment. Um, and I'm lo really looking forward to seeing how this works out. Um, and also, as a general comment, I find this presentation to be intriguing and exceptionally thorough and detailed. And I really um, look forward to seeing how this works through. It's uh, quite remarkable, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Karen. Um, <clears throat> how, uh, just a comment about how far we have come. And I know we're not at the end of the road yet, a long way from it, but boy, how far we have come. And all I could think of was, wow. And I know that's probably not, uh, but I think of collaborative, informative, inclusive process. Um, and when we started out, folks had great concerns about um, something 
a plan that that was was not going to involve a lot of Vermonters and and people specifically within the system and pieces of the system. And again, how far we have come and how very proud I am of um, the good people that we've put in our employ to help us along the way. And boy, for anyone who thinks, how come it's not done yet? Look at the work that needs to be done before we get where we need to be. And I'm so proud of this. And we've got such good people here already in our employ and then the people we've brought in to guide us. And um, I want to thank everyone. And Sophie, you're, you're shouldering a lot of this very quietly um, from behind the scenes. And I want to thank you. Well, it's definitely been a team effort. And I, as you say, there's a long way to go, but we, we shouldn't forget how far we've come in a year. Oh. So. Incredible, incredible. And I, I do want to say that two of those positions that were um, Wilson noted, the business and process analyst and the business intelligence lead, both those positions are posted. Um, the financial analyst position, I think, will get posted soon. Um, so again, there may be folks internally that, that think they would be a good fit for those positions and they should certainly apply for them. Otherwise, we will be looking, again, to bring, bring people in, bring some expertise in from outside to help us uh, with those pieces. But um, yeah, I'm very comfortable with this approach. It's, it's, I'm very happy to have Wilson on board and to start getting some structure because before, you know, everyone's been pitching in and doing things, but it's been relatively unstructured. So I'm, definitely my comfort level has increased now that we've got some structure. Jim, anything else? Um, just a little comment. One of the very first slides, maybe the first slide, said that where we're going will uh, align with Vermont's business employment needs, which I agree with. Although, as we know, having reviewed the correspondence that flies into our inbox from time to time, there's concern about liberal arts and are we throwing it out, you know, baby out with the bathwater. Um, I know I, we agree where we need to go, but I'm curious to know at the end of the, as we approach the end of the tunnel here, um, how liberal arts um, will remain or and or how they'll be integrated with what we end up as our product. Um, because as some of you know, I'm a proponent of, of um, including liberal arts, liberal arts in a broad, functional, useful education. So I'm curious to see how this ends up. You know, I'm not objecting to anything at this point in time. It's not my business and I don't think it would be appropriate. But I do find the question um, interesting and let's see where we end up. Thanks. I, I would I would just add it's not one or the other. I think um, liberal arts will absolutely be there as we move forward. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that's a little unsettling for people is the focus that came out of the select committee work and and the conversations we had with the legislature about the importance of the Vermont State Colleges to the workforce in Vermont. So that's why it's gotten a lot of attention. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean that that's we're not going to be focused on liberal arts as we move forward. I think there's there's obviously recognition that uh, liberal arts is sort of essential for careers into the future. We're not just training um, people to do one job, although we obviously have a lot of very specific programs that we do that are critical to the state. So it's the combination of both. I just think people are a little uncomfortable with the fact that we're now talking so much about workforce development and critical occupations, but that's not to suggest that we're not also going to be continuing with the liberal arts as well as we move forward. And I appreciate it and I hope I wasn't implying it was a one or the other kind of uh, choice. And um, but yeah, I appreciate the answer and I think we'll figure it out, but thank you. Yeah, another thing, Jim, is if you look back at the RPK report, uh, there is a, under the market analysis, there were certain courses that were clearly liberal arts oriented and were indicated as liberal arts. They're not really uh, market analysis for like A, B, or C, they were clearly liberal arts uh, entities. And whatever the RPK group has been doing and the faculty will do this this summer, will probably align pretty quickly in with what the things that Wilson and Kelly are talking about. Because liberal arts are in fact workforce development right. courses, you know, to think and to make decisions, so. Understood and much appreciated.
Yeah, okay. Uh, Karen? Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you brought that, that up, Jim. And I would just point out that, that um, in the time that I've been on the board, and it's been a number of years, I don't think, and I'm looking at the screen now, and I don't know everyone intimately, but as I look at board members, I don't know that we've ever had such a strong representation of liberal arts based people as trustees. And um, I'm confident that I share your concern, Jim. I think that's, that's the core of education. That's the core of humanness. And you can't do anything well, even with a machine, if you're not a good person first. So um, I think as we keep that and we look at diversity, humanness is important. We have to keep that at our, as our center. And I, I'm confident that we as a board are going to be uh, vocal about that and pulling folks back to that if in fact it should ever veer away. And I'm not saying that it would, but um, I thank you, Jim, for bringing that up. Anyone else have any questions? Wilson, do you want to, or you or Kelly want to address some of the issues Sue talked about? This is right up her alley. She's very excited about this. She's just retired as the performance manager for the state. So um, she probably understands this a lot better than most of us did. I didn't know what a project manager was exactly until you just went through that process. Um, do you have any, any further comments? From what people have asked. Well, I guess the only other comment I would make is, you know, today was really to talk about the process and how we're going to organize the work. I think one of the other sort of deliverables we have with it is to sort of figure out the accountability matrix of sort of who's accountable for what, not just, you know, at a, at a program or institution level, but also inclusive of the, the board and, and sort of how we think about um, how we manage those accountabilities and also the the metrics that go with it. So how are we measuring our progress against all of the things that are sort of included within transformation, uh, as well as the outcomes that we want to measure uh, going forward? Yeah, I would just add that I one thing Wilson and I have spent a lot of time together over the past few weeks, and I think one of the perspectives Wilson brings to the process, um, which is critical, is really the focus of student on students. When we really put students front and center in this decision making process, um, I think it, it makes the conversations easier, right? Um, in many ways. So I've really appreciated that in terms of the approach. It's just a consistent theme in terms of how um, how he's suggesting and providing structure to the conversations ahead of us. And I'm just seeing how valuable that is in just the few short weeks that he's been here. And I think it's making our team stronger in terms of how we approach this moving ahead. So. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a very good presentation. I really did get a feel as to what a project manager does, which is helpful. Anyone else have any other comments? Um, Sophie, do you have any comments to end this? Or I know we're working hard on this. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll continue. You know, we're issuing our transformation updates every couple of weeks out to um, our communities. We certainly will be thinking about. Um, communications now that things are loosening up in the state, but really probably focus more on the fall when, when people come back, you know, but we'll certainly be um, communicating as much as we can over the summer to make sure people know what's going on. Um, and what we're actually thinking about doing is even including uh, what the presentation that Wilson and Kelly just did as a, as a Zoom clip um, for our next transformation update so that, you know, the more people get the benefit of understanding this because it is something that's different and it's not something that everyone's familiar with, but I do think it's essential for us if we're going to be successful moving forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Very, very helpful. Thank, thank you for your time. Okay, we're now moving on to finance and facilities. Our chair of that committee is not present today. He had an important board meeting. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head who the Vice chair is uh, the chair is uh, the vice chair is also missing in action. So I was going to ask Sharon to kind okay. of lead us through. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Well, I'm happy to give the report. Obviously, uh, um, you'll need to take it away on all the action items. Uh, the Finance and Facilities Committee met on May 24th. There were four main topics on the agenda. 
The first topic was the review and approval of a modification to the Glenn and Marga Sproul Endowment, as found on pages 14 to 17 of your packet. The donors, Glenn and Margaret Sproul, created this endowment in 2013 with $35,000. Their intent at the time was to create an endowment uh, that would create an endowed chair of mathematics for the NVU Johnson campus when the corpus grew large enough. Since 2013, they have continued to make many significant contributions to the endowment, and it currently stands at a little more than $777,000. They wish to revise the endowment to more closely match their current wishes and the environment of the Vermont State Colleges. Therefore, they request to change the purpose of the endowment to provide non-salary support for faculty in mathematics and sciences to improve the quality of their teaching. They request that priority be given to mathematics faculty on the Johnson campus, with second priority to science faculty on the Johnson campus, and a third priority to math and science faculty at all of the campuses within the Vermont State College system. The committee recommends to the full board the approval of the expansion of the scholarship. Okay, we need a motion uh, to expand the, um, the Glenn and Margaret Spruill Endowment. I'll make that motion. Okay, Sean makes the motion, a second on that. Okay, Shirley has made a second. Any further discussion or di questions on this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the expansion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Seeing none, that has been, um, voted on and approved. Uh, we also have a resolution 2021-015 uh, for banking and investment. Can you explain what that's about, Sharon, please? Absolutely. This resolution, which is reviewed and approved annually, authorizes certain personnel within the Vermont State Colleges to perform banking and investment activities on behalf of the Vermont State Colleges. Um, so it's a standard resolution. We do this every year, and it gives the authority for us to create banking accounts, perform banking activities, and investment activities. Okay. This, this was in our packages. I hope everyone had a chance to read. It's got a very long resolve uh, pieces to it. Is there someone who would like to make a motion to accept the resolution 2021-015 for banking and investment? I'll move that. Okay, Ryan moves it. Do you want to second that, Jim? Okay, would be any further discussion or questions? We've apparently seen this before, haven't we? Sharon. Absolutely, you see this every year in June. Okay. Any further questions or discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving that resolution, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that motion has passed. Now um, that resolves that. Uh, you don't have anything else to report, do you? And you're reporting budget related materials provided in the meeting materials. There uh, is a system wide budget proposal, a resolution that does need to be approved. Okay. Okay, I don't see that here. Can you explain a little bit more on that, please? Absolutely. Um, at the May meeting, we discussed the proposed system-wide budget. Um, and as discussed there, before the use of one time and new sources of funding, the deficit will be $36 million. Um, that number is in the lower third of the deficit range that we've been sharing throughout the budgeting process. Um, and that when we apply all one-time funds and new funds, the deficit will be approximately 6.3 million, all of which will be covered through the use of carry forward funds um, from this current fiscal year. Uh, this budget did include two new features this year. Uh, the first were key performance indicators or benchmarking metrics that will help the board gauge the health of the system's finances as we move throughout the year. And then the second aspect was a five-year budget pro forma that will be used to assist the system in financial planning. So the resolution is number 2021-016 and it's found on page 23 of your packet. Page 23. Okay. Any questions or any discussions? I'd like a motion on that. So moved. Ryan's moving it. Sean, you're seconding it. Okay, we have a motion on the table. 
for the uh, budget analysis that we put forward uh, from the May meeting. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add, and I should have said before, before Sharon started speaking, but for Shirley and Sue, um, Sharon is our chief financial officer and our chief operating officer. So I apologize, I didn't give her her title before. Okay, we have a report from the executive committee. Um, I'm going to say that uh, several things that we discussed, we're going to have the retreat like we have had in the past, but did not have in 2020 at Lake Maury, September 20th, September of 2021. Uh, we have the dates. And I believe that's in the calendar that we also got from the uh, chancellor's office in our package. Um, this will be the pretty generally one overnight uh, retreat. Um, we're going to focus, I believe, on uh, a few housekeeping things and we're also going to do board development and continue with that. We also are, um, we're also currently reviewing proposals submitted in response to an RFP for an executive search firm to assist with the search for president for the new university, the new combined entity. Um, I can let uh, the chancellor discuss where that stands at the moment, if that's okay with you. Sure, so we, we received four uh, proposals came in. Um, we met uh, last week to discuss what to do with the proposals that came in. Uh, we, we whittled it down to two different um, search firms and um, Sharon again uh, recently sort of interviewed both of them. Um, so I, we're just waiting to make the final decision as to which firm to move forward with. Um, but I think we got some very good feedback just from the two um, interviews that Sharon did with regard to timing um, and some other suggestions about, um, about the search. But I think it will be beneficial for us to have um, the benefit of an executive search firm that really understands the landscape um, and help them. And this is gonna be a, a very big decision um, as to who will be the president of the new university. So it's best that we you know, get the expertise that we need to make sure we get the right person um, for this position moving forward. Our, our goal right now is to try to bring somebody on board for July 1 of 2022, understanding that the new university will be launched in July of 2023. Um, but it's important to have the president on board to help shape what that new university looks like um, as we move forward. So that's where we're at right now on, on the executive search. Yes, and part of that search will be a search committee and some members of the board will be on that, among others. Um, we have a few search committees that we've had in the past. It'll be patterned be very similar to what we've had done in the past. Uh, any questions on that? Sure, Ryan. Yeah, just, just real quick to clarify, Sophie, did you say we would have this new president in July 1 of next year or was my understanding that was January 1? Has that date moved? Um, yeah, I think based on the conversations that we had with the search firms, um, the concern is, you know, it really follows the academic hiring cycle. And uh, they were recommending that we look to hire somebody for July 1 of 2022 because there's a concern as to who's, you know, the quality of the pool if you're looking for a January one hire. Does that make sense? It does, yes, thank, yeah. you. thank you. Any other questions or, or discussion? Okay, the third thing that we did is that we did make a motion uh, to recommend to the, uh, to the board um, for the chancellor to reappoint President Joyce Judy, President Patricia Moulton, Interim President Jonathan Spiro, and for the board to reappoint Chancellor Zadotny for the upcoming 21-22 academic year. Um, the chancellor appoints the presidents, we appoint the chancellor, and we uh, need a motion to that effect. So, so moved move by Karen. Mary, you're, exactly. you're seconding that, okay. Um, chancellor, um, can you describe the, the way that we've done this in the past and what we're doing this year? The two yes. years. The... So actually it is the, it is the board that appoints the presidents and then I'm responsible for negotiating the, the terms, uh, with them. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I met with each of the presidents. Uh, we had a discussion 
Um, and then the presidents met individually with the executive committee of the board. And then the executive committee made its recommendation to the, to the full board here. Um, and so I will be issuing um, appointment letters for uh, the three presidents uh, moving forward. And Lynn will be <laughs> issuing my letter. Yes. Okay, any questions or any discussion? There is a motion on the table. We do have um, anything else we wanna ask. Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, congratulations to the <laughs> Chancellor and the three presidents. The next thing is the report from the nominating committee. The chairman of the nominating committee cannot be here today, so I will um, make the motion to uh, reelect the, um, well, my term actually goes for two years, so we don't have to reelect me. That's a relief, I guess. But we made a motion to reelect Vice Chair Megan Kluver, Treasurer David Silverman, and Secretary Karen Luno. I need a second on that. Second. Sure. Yes, several seconds. <laughs> um, any discussion or questions? All those in favor of the motion as stated, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we have a, that's the executive, that's the executive committee. We also have a motion to uh, elect people to the audit committee. Um, we have, we, so the motion is to reelect David Silverman, Dylan Giambantista, Mary Moran and Sean Tester to the audit and risk management committee. We will be missing one person because Linda Milne is no longer on the board. Um, and we will just work on the motion of the people that have already been nominated. And I need a second on that. Okay, Ryan, is any discussion or questions? Seeing none, the, um, we'll vote on the motion to reelect the audit risk management committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now Linda Milne is stepping off the board now. Um, we, have, we have discussed an option of um, making a motion to elect, appoint Sue Zeller to serve on the risk and audit management, the, the audit and risk management committee. Uh, would anyone like to make a second to that motion? Karen? Okay, we have uh, Karen Luna seconded. Any discussion or uh, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you, Sue. I just, I just want to clarify that um, under, under the bylaws for uh, the Board of Trustees and the Trustee Handbook, um, members of the Audit and Risk Management Committee are elected by the full board. The other committee assignments are handled by the board chair. Um, so again, if, um, you know, just so you're not surprised by why, why we voted on this one, but we don't vote on the other ones. It's just the way that it's structured under our bylaws and our handbook. Yes. And uh, we'll have to pick a new chair for that committee, but we will, we will do that. Okay, now we have a report from the Diversity, Equality and Inclusion Committee. Um, that's Mary Moran. Mary's having a hard time with her sound. Unmute. There you are. Am I unmuted? You are. Okay, so quick uh, quick update. Um, we met on Monday, June 7th. Um, all committee members, Chancellor's Office staff, and Lynn and Karen attended as well. Also present were Joyce Judy and Pat Moulton, as well as several guest speakers from the colleges. Um, Yasmin spoke about the recent VC. The SCS Academic Retreat held virtually on May 25th. And Jesse Stonewall was a keynote speaker, speaker and spoke about inclusion and student engagement. Yasmin also shared an update on the adoption of the general education program inclusive of DEI learning outcomes from the faculty assemblies. Um, 
there was an update on the definitions from the social justice group. And the committee voted unanimously to invite public comment and feedback for the proposed definitions. Um, and that meeting is scheduled on September 13th. And there was a discussion about an anti-racism pledge from the VSCS social justice group. And the general discussion referred to a draft and we discussed it, but there was no action taken. That's it. Any questions or discussions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, there'll be no action on that. We also have the next, we have the board calendar. This was also something that was distributed in the packet. It was, uh, it talks about, it shows all of the meetings that are planned for the coming year, most of which seem to be on Zoom. There is um, the retreat, which will be in person in September. Any comments or any discussion on that? Uh, Sophie, do you want to give any kind of uh, comments on what was planned or how that was planned? Yeah, so we've, um, the thought was that, you know, this has worked very well doing our meetings via Zoom. It really facilitates participation. I know today we've had a couple of folks that did have um, conflicts and couldn't be here, but generally we've had phenomenal uh, participation from trustees. And I think it's been facilitated by the fact that we've been able to do things by Zoom. It really enables, um, you know, people from our communities to participate, to watch if they, if they're not available to watch in real time, they're able to watch the live stream later. Um, so we don't want to lose some of that. At the same time, we do know how valuable it is for trustees to connect with the campuses. So um, given that we've, we're now in an era where we're meeting more frequently than historically we've met, um, historically the, the full board has met four times a year. The thought was that we would have four in-person meetings. Again, one would be at the Lake Maury for the retreat, which is a, is a two-day event. But then typically we've gone to campuses to do three of the board meetings during the year um, and to preserve that. So that's what we're proposing is essentially maintaining Zoom meetings for committees um, and, for, and for some of these interim board meetings. But the, the four traditional board meetings would be in person with three of them being on the campuses um, coming up. And again, the campus ones were, were the ones that traditionally we've, we've gone to the campuses. So December, March, and um, June. Any questions on that? Love, would love to be able to get back at doing that. <laughs> That's the goals, be able to interact personally. <laughs> yep. Shirley, you have a question? Yes, I was gonna ask Sophie about the retreat on Monday, September 20th uh, and Tuesday. What time will the retreat start on Monday? Typically we, we have folks come sort of for lunchtime and then we really start in the afternoon. And then depending on how much business there is on Tuesday, we either finish at lunchtime on Tuesday or we finish you know, early to mid afternoon on Tuesday. Um, it really depends. It's again, it is an opportunity for the trustees get, and particularly given what we've gone through in the past year where we haven't seen anyone at all, yes. um, it'll be more important than ever, but they're an opportunity for trustees to, to sort of get to know each other a little bit outside of, you know, formal board meetings. Um, there will typically be some training, some board assessment, self-evaluation for the board. Um, and we, we are planning for the August 4th board meeting on doing some of our routine trainings then as well, just so we're not fully loading trainings um, at the board retreat. Um, but yeah, we're working on the agenda for that now, but typically people get there around lunchtime or early afternoon for it. Okay, thank you. I teach on Mondays, but I rearrange my schedule for this. Oh, well, thank you very morning. much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There will be a more detailed schedule that you should be getting soon, that we all should be getting soon, Shirley. Okay, um, we have to ha approve this. So um, I'm gonna make a motion that we vote to accept the, the schedule that the chancellor has sent out to us. 
We need a second on that. Second, Mary, several of you. Um, any more questions or concerns, any discussion? Seeing none, all those who approve of the, the board schedule, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any dissent, opposition? No, thank you, it's passed. We do have additional business. I'm going to turn this over again to the chancellor. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, and let the board know that um, the Council of Presidents met in person back in mid-May. That was our first uh, time seeing each other. It was exciting to do. Um, but we met to start talking about uh, the new combined entity, the new university, and um, the sort of senior leadership team that would be needed for that university, given that some decisions really can't wait until next summer when we hope to have a new president on board. And so uh, through our discussions, we identified two specific positions that were identified as being essential and for which the need to fill them was immediate. And the first was for a provost for the new university and the second was for a dean of enrollment. So in consultation with the presidents, it was agreed that we had well-qualified candidates for both positions within the Vermont State College system and that we should explore their interest in taking on uh, those roles. So I'm, I'm really pleased to announce that Nolan Atkins, the provost of Northern Vermont University and Maurice Wimette, who's the Dean of Enrollment at Castleton University have both agreed to step into those roles. Both of them are experienced, they're well-qualified, they're highly respected, and we believe they'll be an excellent fit for those two positions. Uh, they are, needless to say, extremely busy, and I've been working with them and with their presidents to explore what resources will be needed to give them the additional capacity um, to take on these new roles while also continuing to support the critical work that they perform at their current institutions. Um, and just to be clear, part of the transformation budget um, that we submitted to the legislature and was funded does include funding to help backfill these positions. So there will be some additional resources there that we can tap uh, to help support both of them. Um, I do anticipate that one of the questions many people will have is how decisions are going to be made as to who will fill uh, positions in the new university. Uh, many of those decisions will ultimately be made by the president of the new university when they come on board. But in the interim, if as happened here, there's a determination made that there's a position that's critical and we need to fill it prior to the new president coming on board, then the process that we're using is that I will work in consultation with the presidents as to how best to fill those positions. And then depending on the particular circumstances and the available talent pool that we have within the Vermont State Colleges, um, the particular decision-making process may vary. So for example, some positions may be filled by selection, uh, some may be done through internal postings and applications, and some may be done through an external search process. So there's no one size fits all, but I just wanted to be clear that we're, you know, we're trying to be as thoughtful as we can be as we make these decisions moving forward. And I did just want to add, um, to sort of compare this to the, the presentation that you received earlier from, from Wilson and Kelly, um, leading or serving on a transformation project team doesn't mean that a person has been selected to fill that particular role in the new university. The two processes are distinguishable and there are many reasons why someone may be asked to lead or serve on a project team, um, including ensuring that different institutions and different functional areas are represented. Um, and so being selected or being asked to serve on a team or to serve as a lead for a team shouldn't be interpreted as meaning that that person um, is, is somehow the anointed person to, to serve in that role in the new combined entity. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that, that people were aware of that. We will be making um, an announcement when we send out our transformation update about both um, Nolan and Maurice, but I wanted to let the board know um, that we're very, very happy that they've both agreed to step into those roles moving forward. Thank you. Congratulations, Maurice and, and Nolan. Maurice is wonderful. It's a very good choice, Sophie. <laughs> Thank you. Nolan's pretty wonderful too. I just want to be clear. Yeah, and I don't know him, but I know Maurice. Yeah. I just want to say also for additional business, this is really old business, but it was um, the last week or so, 10 days ago, we had a press conference 
uh, the day after the governor signed the budget, we had a press conference with the presidents who presented with along with um, Marilyn, whose name my last name I can't remember, but Cargill. She, Cargill from VSAC, yeah. VSAC, and they talked about the scholarships and the different uh, projects that were funded in the budget that are going to help critical uh, positions, critical positions and employment in the state, as well as a variety of other scholarships available to Vermonters. And uh, it got quite a bit of good press coverage and it was a very successful press conference. And I wanna thank uh, President Moulton for, for hosting that, but it was a, a really big deal. And it's apparently gotten a lot of, uh, generated some activity in terms of people applying. So that's all very good. Now, do we have any comments from the public? Jen, do you have anyone who has signed up? Chair Dickinson, we do not have anyone who has signed up. Is there anyone present who would like to make a comment? Please raise your hand. Looks like no. Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. We now need a motion to go into executive session. Uh, which I think I have here. Yes. Okay, so I move the Board of Trustees under executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A2 to discuss negotiating or securing real estate purchase or lease options. In addition, I move the Board of Trustees enter into executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A 1B to discuss labor relations and agreements with employees. 1 VSA 313A1E to discuss pending litigation. 1 VSA 313A1F for the purpose of receiving confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services. Because premature general public knowledge of these discussions would place VSC at a substantial disadvantage, no formal or binding action shall be taken in executive session except for actions relating to real estate transactions. Along with the members of the board president at this meeting and its discretion, the board invites the chancellor, the general counsel, the president and dean of administration of Vermont Technical to attend. I need a second on that. Mary seconds that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, we have a breakout room usually to go into executive session. So we can join that. Shirley and Sue, you'll see a, a, an invitation on your screen. Just click OK, and you'll be whisked to the breakout room. Or join. That's what mine says. <laughs> join. Thank you. Oh, Pat, uh, Lynn, you're muted. Okay, let me just say again, we've now back in open session. It's now 5 and 4. Are there any more discussions or questions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded by Jim. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Any discussion? Seeing none, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us and being with us. And uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed. Thank you. Bye-bye.